Good, you got it. Welcome to the Orvis Guide to Fly Fishing. I'm your host, Tom Rosenbauer. Bass are the number one sport fish in North America, and for good reason. They're readily available, aggressive, and a lot of fun to catch. Best of all, you can catch them virtually anywhere in both rural and urban settings. Heck, you can even catch them in Central Park. Catching bass on a fly rod is so much fun and anyone can do it. In this episode, we'll discuss all the basics you need to catch bass on a fly rod. Nice fish. Oh, yeah, nice fish. That fish has already refused that fly. You're going to have to try just a slightly different pattern. The roll cast pickup is a great cast to use in a lot of fishing situations. This is a beautiful wild trout from a small stream. Just a gorgeous little fish. I say hit that bank. Let's go to that grass bed. The Orvis Guide to Fly Fishing is supported by Orvis Fly Fishing. Algoma Country. Destination Ontario. Main Office of Tourism. Yellowstone Teton Territory. Crazy Rainbow Ranch. Bahamas Tourism. Adipose Boat Works. Global Rescue. Trout Unlimited. I love catching bass. They strike hard, they jump, and they're a lot of fun to catch, especially on a fly rod. I know that many of you already fish for bass using plastic worms, topwater lures, and hard baits. Well, fly fishing is similar. It's all about figuring out what the bass are feeding on. We use different types of flies to imitate these food sources for bass, then present them as naturally as possible. This can be anything from imitating a frog or a mouse on the surface to flies that replicate bait fish or even crayfish underwater. And some bass flies don't look like anything in particular. They just look good to eat. The key is to get the fly near a bass and make it look like something alive. It doesn't really take much to get started in fly fishing for bass. You need an inexpensive rod outfit and some basic flies. Then you're in business. Bass are often aggressive and opportunistic and will attack anything that looks alive. You don't really have to worry that much about fly selection, and that's why bass fishing is a great way to get started. Often this action is all on the surface, which makes it that much more exciting because everything is visual. But first, let's discuss the physical differences between largemouth and smallmouth bass, and also discuss the environments they inhabit. Differentiating smallmouth and largemouth is simple. If the mouth only extends to the middle of the eye, it's a smallmouth. If the mouth extends beyond the eye, then it's a largemouth. Body markings are also a giveaway. Largemouth are green and have a defined black lateral line. Smallmouth are brown or bronze with vertical black lines and usually some horizontal lines on their cheeks. To understand the environments bass live in at different times of year, I went right to the expert, my friend Dave Phillip. Dave has spent his life studying bass professionally as a biologist and also chasing them with a fly rod. Largemouth and smallmouth bass are similar in a lot of ways, but they do have some subtle differences. In the springtime, as the water warms, they move into the shallows, one, to warm up so that they become more active and they look for food items as well that are also trying to warm up, so minnows and frogs are along the banks in the, in the springtime and they're looking for those. Uh, they also are moving into spawn. As the water temperatures warm up, they're done with spawning. Smallmouths tend to move into deeper, cooler water more so than largemouths. Although both you could get along the shallows at dawn and at dusk, but largemouths hang out in the lily pads and the weeds and the shallows all year round 
in the sticks, etc. So they also tend to go into different types of water. Large mouths like darker, weedier, warmer water. Small mouths like cooler water, either flowing streams or in deeper water off a rocky point. So in the heat of the summer, you need to look in deep water for small mouths, sometimes shallower water for large mouths. Back in the fall, then they'll get more active in the shallows and move in and feed heavily, getting ready for winter. So they can be off deep points, feeding on minnows, following minnows up at night into the shoreline, etc. And so it depends on the time of the day, the time of the season, which species you're looking at, but you'll still be able to catch fish. You have to consider two factors, whether the bass can be caught below the surface or on the surface. The answer is based on a few simple factors, what the bass are hunting for in terms of forage, and of course the impact of weather, time of day, and time of year. If you haven't fished for bass before, these are things you'll quickly learn. The key is we have two choices of presentations to make with a fly rod, either on top or below the surface. Most of the time, you can catch bass on subsurface flies, just like with conventional lures. Bass love to eat minnows, shad, even juvenile bass if they can. Bait fish provide a lot of nutrition for a bass, which is critical for their survival. There's a wide variety of conventional lures available that imitate various bait fish based on shape, color, and action. Bass flies are the same. They're also made to replicate the size, color, and relative action of bait fish. The only difference is that the flies are made from feathers, fur, and synthetics, whereas lures are usually made from plastic or wood. The same comparison applies for other food sources for bass. Things like crayfish, mice, and frogs. Some people tie their own flies, but you don't need to do that. You can buy already made flies from your local fly shop or online catalog store. You just need a good general selection based on the kind of bass food that's in your area. So let's discuss the equipment needed for fly fishing for bass. The best all-round rod for bass fishing for largemouth and smallmouth is probably an eight weight. Um, you need an eight weight because you need a heavier line to drive some of those bigger flies, more air resistant flies like hair bugs and big poppers and, and big, uh, big hairy streamers. Now if you're only fishing for smallmouths, you can use a, a six or even a seven weight because the flies are a little bit smaller and it's not really determined by the size of the fish, it's more the size of fly you're fishing. And, um, Large mouths, bigger, more air resistant flies. Small mouths, smaller, slimmer flies in general. For bass fishing, you don't need an expensive reel. Your reel is mainly gonna be used for storing your line. You don't need an expensive drag system for bass because they seldom pull any line. The best fly line to use is a simple weight forward taper, which will help turn over the large flies used for top water bugs. So now we have some of the basics of bass fishing. Let's look at how to apply these basics to rivers, streams, and lakes. It's really easy to understand and I know you'll have a ball doing it. Come on up, baby. Yeah! Sometimes you have to go deep for a bass. Days like this, you've got to go deep. Virtually every large city in North America has ponds, lakes, or rivers that hold bass. The first thing you should know about bass in rivers and streams is that generally, largemouths and smallmouths will seek out different parts of moving water. Largemouth bass will usually be in the slower, weedier, deeper sections of a river, especially around logs, roots, fallen trees, and weed beds. Smallmouth can tolerate faster moving water and will be right in the current or riffles. They like to hold behind and in front of boulders, rocks, along banks, and especially around rock ledges. They can also find cover around fallen trees and logs, but they like it to be a little bit closer to moving water. Generally, it's easy to locate bass on small creeks and rivers. It'll be pretty apparent where they're living. On larger rivers, which are actually almost like lakes, it's a little bit tougher and you have to seek out the structure. I guess what I like about stream fishing for bass is that they're usually easy to locate. 
Find a riffle running into deeper water or some structure and you're bound to find smallmouths. Small streams and most rivers are easy to fish from the bank or just by wearing waders and walking in the water. On larger, deeper rivers, you'll probably have to use a boat. Again, look for structure that'll hold and attract bass and put your fly as close to the cover as possible. Searching for bass on lakes takes a little more thought and research. There's a lot of big water in most big lakes that'll be empty of bass. So you have to determine where the structure is and where their food supply might be. On lakes, structure is key, especially if it's close to deep water. Bass like deep water because it provides security from their predators. Structures that you should cast to include docks, boathouses, rocky shorelines, shoals, fallen trees, weed beds, and any other kind of structure that will provide cover to the bass. You also need to consider what the bass might be eating. Your powers of observation can help a lot with this. When you wade into a river and notice lots of small crayfish along the bottom, that's a pretty good indicator the bass will be keyed into eating them. So a crayfish pattern will be best. Bass love crayfish. It also means that you should be casting to rocky shorelines where the crayfish are most likely to be living. You can get it to sink straight on it. Good, he's got it. All right. He ate that crayfish pretty well. They love minnows, they love leeches, they love insects, big insect larvae, but uh, crayfish are their number one prey. You can never go wrong fishing a sunken crayfish fly to a smallmouth. Beautiful fish. Don't have to handle him at all and away he goes. Oh, smallmouth bass. You know, although, although we'd like to catch these smallmouths on the surface, middle of a bright day, fish are in pretty deep water. So we're fishing a crayfish fly. And you got to be careful when you fish a crayfish fly. You want to throw it beyond where you think the fish is and then strip it back and let it drop, strip it back and let it drop and watch the tip of your floating line because that fish took it on the drop as they usually did. And all I saw was that line dart forward and then I did a strip strike and there was the fish. Slide out the hook and away they go. On the other hand, if you see minnows jumping from the water, pretty good indication that they're being chased by predators like bass. If you see this, it's a good idea to switch to a streamer fly that imitates a minnow and it should be roughly the same size and shape as the minnows you saw jumping. Cast right into where you saw the minnows jump might be in for a surprise. You don't need a wide variety of flies for smallmouth bass. First and foremost is some sort of crayfish imitation like this one here. It's weighted, gets down near the bottom and you fish it with twitches or just sinking to the bottom. Uh, one of the most popular flies for smallmouth bass is a black woolly bugger. It imitates helger mites, which they feed on in streams very heavily. Also could be a crayfish imitation or some sort of baitfish or leech imitation, but smallmouths love a black woolly bugger. Uh, then maybe some sort of trout dry fly, uh, like this big stone fly. Uh, they will come up for insects, and um, some big, some big trout-sized flies will work for smallmouths. Uh, and then a couple of surface flies. A slider, like this white sneaky peat. This one doesn't make quite as much commotion in the water. And then finally, a popping bug, one with a, a face that pops that makes some noise in the water. Smallmouth are aggressive feeders and they will come up for a, for a popper that's worked fairly aggressively across the surface. Because largemouth bass are such voracious predators, they'll eat almost anything and they got a big mouth so they can inhale some pretty large flies. The flies you're going to use probably a little bit bigger than you use for smallmouths. Some of the popular ones are some sort of streamer. Uh, this one happens to imitate a, a sunfish and sunfish are not only uh, prime largemouth bass food but they're also nest predators on largemouth bass so they'll, they'll grab a sunfish when it gets near. Uh, this is a twisty tail with lead eyes. It doesn't imitate anything really. It's a lure, just like a bass lure. Uh, traditional cork popper is one of the most fun ways to catch a largemouth, particularly mornings and evenings when they're, when they're near the surface and in shallow water. Uh, then they eat a lot of frogs. 
This happens to be a deer hair frog. Great fly for largemouths, fun to fish. And then finally, who could go largemouth fishing without a mouse imitation? They eat lots of mice and small rodents. So now we understand more about rivers, streams, and lakes, and where bass will live in them. We've also discussed using our powers of observation to detect what the bass may be eating. Now we'll discuss casts and retrieves to tie it all together. In fly fishing, the line propels the fly. In spin fishing, casting the lure propels the line to the target. It's important to understand you don't need to make long casts to catch a bass on a fly. Simple casts of 20 to 30 feet will be fine. Now let's visit my friend Pete Kutzer from the Orvis Fly Fishing Schools for some tips on casting big bass bugs in the wind. Hi, I'm Pete Kutzer from the Orvis Fly Fishing Schools. Today we're going to talk about tips on how to cast in windy conditions. Wind can be a little bit intimidating for some folks. Trying to cast that fly in, the, in those windy conditions can be a little bit difficult. However, there are some things we can do to help deal with that wind. A wind coming at you, a wind coming at your non-casting shoulder, a wind coming at your casting shoulder or behind you. There are different casts we can do for each one of these situations. Let's start off with a wind coming directly at you. A wind coming straight at you is not the worst wind to deal with. There's a couple things we can do. The first is make a low angle cast and get below the wind. If we can send that fly out underneath the wind, we can deliver that fly to our target. Watch shorebirds when they're flying around at the beach. They almost fly between the waves. There's a lot less wind down low. Another option is to make a high angle back cast and drive that fly down through the wind down to the water. You don't get the best presentation when you're making that cast, but it can help deal with those windy conditions. When you're dealing with a wind coming at your non-casting shoulder, I'm right-handed, so if that wind was blowing at my left shoulder, what I might have to do is compensate for that wind a little bit. I can send that fly a little bit more to the left of that target, and hopefully that wind will blow it on track, or just like with that wind coming at me, I can cast below the wind, making that low angle cast and getting that fly out to target. If I have a wind blowing at my back, that wind can be a little more difficult than you think. You want to make a low angle back cast and get that line underneath the wind. Make sure that line gets out nice and straight. Then we can make that higher angle forward cast. The cast almost looks a little bit like an oval. We're going to make a low back cast, bring the rod tip up, then a high forward cast to deliver that fly out to our target. The worst wind you can deal with is a wind blowing at your casting shoulder. When you're dealing with that wind, that can, in some cases, blow that fly right into you, hooking yourself. I've hooked myself in the neck, in the ear, in the back, even in the rear end. It's not very comfortable. So there's a couple techniques. One technique is actually taking that rod tip and angling it over your left hand shoulder. Make a high angle cast and get that line off your shoulder, above you. Uh, one friend used to describe it as combing your hair. Comb your hair, and that's going to keep that fly off of that left shoulder. Another technique is to switch hands. Practice casting with your non-dominant hand. I practice all the time and it really does help in those windy conditions. But perhaps the easiest technique to deal with those windy conditions at your casting shoulder is to simply turn your back to the wind and make a back cast delivering that fly to the fish. That's gonna keep that fly well away from you, keep you nice and safe, and help you catch more fish. Okay. So now we've learned some casting techniques for bass. Let's discuss retrieves that help animate your flies so that they imitate food items that bass prey on. Now all of these flies work very well, but you have to do your part. You have to animate the fly so it looks to the bass like something it wants to eat. Animating and retrieving a bass fly is the fun part of fly fishing for bass because you're making it look natural with your own motions. <laughs> the best way to give action to a bass fly is to keep your rod tip low and give it all the action by stripping the line at various speeds. There's a real tendency when you're bass fishing to twitch the rod tip to give the fly action and that creates problems. It throws slack 
into your line, you're gonna miss strikes and you're not gonna be prepared for the next cast. So if you can, it's hard to do, but if you can, try to give that fly action by stripping the line and keeping the rod tip low to the water. You'll really get the same action and you'll always be in control of your fly. When you're fishing with a sinking line, you wanna try all different kinds of retrieves. You can't see the fish. You don't know how they're reacting to the fly. So uh, sometimes you wanna do long, slow strips, just barely crawling that fly along and really long strips so that the fly goes steady. Other times you might wanna give it sharp little wraps or you might wanna really rip the line back in and everything in between. So you've, you've got to experiment. It's usually best to change your retrieve before you change flies. Just like catching bass with conventional tackle, when using a fly rod for bass, you have to understand these fish how they live, how they eat, how they survive, what they do during the day, and what they do throughout the year. But this is part of the fun of fly fishing, learning how they operate within their ecosystems. I encourage you to read everything you can about bass and watch videos to learn more about how to catch them. Catching bass on a fly rod is just a blast. They're available to almost anyone within just a few minutes drive of home. I hope you'll try it out with a fly rod. I know you'll enjoy it. It's <laughs> not hard to figure out why bass are America's favorite game fish, and they're great on a fly rod. You don't have to cast very far. You don't need a lot of fancy flies. You don't need a lot of fancy equipment. Everything I've got here for catching bass costs around $200. Complete fly rod outfit for catching bass. And we're having a ball today. The Orvis Guide to Fly Fishing is supported by Orvis Fly Fishing. Algoma Country. Destination Ontario. Main Office of Tourism, Yellowstone Teton Territory, Crazy Rainbow Ranch, Bahamas Tourism, Adipose Boat Works, Global Rescue, Route Unlimited. <laughs>